What uh, what compels you to be creative? Now, unfortunately, you're trying to identify a source of compulsion. And I don't think that most people um, really identify it. If they do anything, they identify when they sort of knew it. But um, in, in one respect, for me, it's about extending myself out there. And this really kind of a need to be known, you know, know who I am. Both I need to know that and I need others to know that. But this compulsion has been with me since I was, God, four years old or so. Not that I was conscious of it back then, but. Somehow that old adage about know thyself is what drives me. And that's what I said, it's an impossible dream. It's a drive to know myself and to use art as that vehicle. And um, it's just a methodology and it's, um, you know, in, in, many, in most respects it's still an impossibility. And then to add to that impossibility, I'm, I'm attempting to use art so that you can know me, which is even more impossible. <clears throat> I was born in Canada, and it was a rural community, a uh, very small school. They just built it. And so this spring, I have to be, I probably just turned five. And the kindergarten teacher took us out to this mound and just going to, you know, scribble and draw, do whatever. But I was laying on my stomach with my feet up in the air, uh, my back to the teacher, and I began to hear little girls behind, you know, sort of twittering, like, you know, and you kind of knew they were talking about me. And so I quickly you know, whipped around to see what was going on, and the teacher closed the book up. And immediately, the other kids in the class started saying uh, something to the effect that um, she was drawing me. And I had no concept of what it meant to be being drawn. And so I kept after her to show me. And, you know, she was probably typical of somebody at, you know, 19 or 20, you know, her first class, you know, whatever, but, uh, you know, not willing to show it. And eventually she did. And when she opened it up and showed me, what happened was is that this was, of course, a drawing of me from the back. And what I realized, and I'm not going to say that at five year old I recognized this. This is, you know, retrospectively looking backwards. But um, she simultaneously showed me that drawing was a uh, a facility to reach out into the world and to capture things. And given that it was from the back side of me, it showed that I could represent parts of myself that I couldn't see, or it revealed parts of myself that I didn't know. And it was sort of metaphoric in that sense, but I had no real, uh, I'm not going to say recollection or memory or significance of that until I went into recovery essentially uh, 25, 30 years later. And it was in that, uh, you know, sort of anal self-analysis going back, looking at sources and causes and things like that, that, you know, as each one triggers, um, you keep revealing more underneath and you keep going back and farther and farther. And, and I'd recognize that over the decades that that incident at one level or another had had come forward as a sort of emblematic, emblematic image of my past. And I recognize that in my own art, that has always been the sort of strategy, is that uh, I reach out into the world to capture things, which is probably typical of most artists. But the other was this uh, constant search of self and wondering who I am and how I am and using my art to find that. And so to say, uh, you know, why creative or what is creative, um, in my respect, it is about finding out who I am. And that's been a constant. So, 
I gotta say, obviously since five years old. Um, yeah. There was a sort of, uh, I guess, a corresponding connection to uh, what ultimately would prove to be why I'm also an addict. And I mean, uh, the facile way is to talk about both practices, uh, being an addict and being an artist, as being obsessive compulsives. But certainly not that simplistic, it's just that there are parallels when you talk about either one of them. And so the sense of being uh, outside and being different <clears throat> Um, would always be a part of being an artist um, and it was always a double-edged sword because you would have people that would uh, hold you in awe to some extent that you could do this and then you also had others who were dismissive of you because it wasn't a, um, a real thing. Um, later on it would be called, you know, it wasn't a real job, or, you know, why don't you get something you can make a living at and, you know, what's the point, this is all just play. And, you know, as a child, you know, okay, that's it's fine. But as you got older, they go, when are you going to stop doing this nonsense and do something real? And so that's sort of... Not doing anybody any good. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and so that kind of isolation was always there. It was always, but, you know, I'm not gonna, yeah, as a child, you're not necessarily going to know specifically what that is. Um, when you have parents that you show your work to them and they're sort of, not really dismissive, but they're not really enthusiastic about it. They don't support it as this is the primary direction I'm taking. And so I interpreted it as a personal affront um, and a rejection. And that's always been uh, a constant as well, as that the nature of my art and the nature of self are simultaneous. And in fact, when the first day that I promised to myself that I was going to start recovery, it wasn't based on myself, it was based on my art. It was that if I want to pursue and become, I've got to get off of this damn uh, wagon. So for about, I'm going to say, five or six months, I kept thinking that this is what I was doing. But in the process of making the work and attempting to understand the process, I realized that the art and myself were identical and, and of course what I was really doing was attempting to recover myself. I gotta say that it would be probably another 15, maybe close to 20 years before I was able to step outside of an art practice that was almost purely in search of self to working with ideas and images that dealt with the outside world. and. Um, you know, that's, uh, it was, I don't know if I can say it was a hard place to step outside of, but I recognized there was a certain level of narcissism that was growing in that kind of focus. And at the same time, I uh, was learning to understand that the nature of self is not an independent function, that it's an interconnected function between self and the rest of the world. And in fact, there isn't this polarity, there isn't this other and self, and that there is always this sort of constant flowing back and forth between the two. And that to some extent, you know, who we are is almost this thing that's floating between. And it has to stay flexible. You can't, you can't come to some place and say, okay, this is who I am, because that'll never be. It, it's always in flux. It, it's curious that the use of the muse is actually retro to you know, 4,000 years ago, you know, prior to any of the current forms of religion. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, that refers then to the psychology of, um, of humanity at that time and their sense of place in the world, that everything was animated, everything was sentient, and that 
the idea that a, uh, a muse, that a, an entity could inspire and or guide was not, you know, um, or I should say that was, uh, that was more of a reality to that group. Creative <coughs> spark uh, come from within or without? You might, on any given issue, say the origin is in the chicken or the origin is in the egg. Uh, but in reality, of course, it's both and it's happening simultaneously. Uh, it might be an outside stimulation, um, the war in Iraq, and the, uh, the sort of overwhelming development of a war mentality in the culture at large is what motivated me to do my Guernica piece, The Four Horsemen. The source of the imagery then became my felt sense of a very visceral and emotional response to war because I'd been in war and you know I've shot at people I've had people shoot at me so listening to the platitudes of those in Washington not acknowledging the reality on the on the ground uh, or to anybody else that happens to be getting in the way of their missiles and bombs or the ultimate destruction to their economy all of the ramifications of, of this war so the origins of the imagery to the Four Horsemen then uh, comes from an historical past as a, as a warrior and as a pacifist because of that. And it comes from my knowledge of medieval art history, uh, medieval religious history, and mining those things as source materials because the, um, in, the, in this particular example, the language of war, the language that's coming out of Washington is biblical, it is apocalyptic. My attempt was to speak to them in their language so that there's a shared historical thing, even if they don't necessarily have that historical knowledge. Now they're actually engaging in the ideas they can't disengage from those. They can turn around and walk away, but they've already put them into their head. That's uh, an example of where um, an idea's origins are simultaneously internal and external. The way in which I get to uh, imagery or iconography is through poetry. Not in the sense of sitting down and, and writing it out, although sometimes that happens, uh, but mostly it's through the poetic practice of metaphor, uh, trigger words that you know create a resonance in the body and in that uh, what, you know the really good poetry what it's doing as you're hearing it is suddenly generating visual imagery in your head. It's good poetry is never a, a sense of abstract language of, of linking actual words together it's each of those words is setting up an emotional wave and you're developing you know imagery with that as you're going along and that's what I utilize to mine my own emotional base to generate you know, image and text. Like I said, sometimes it is coming from the outside and then it triggers the emotional and then I then look to it to find the right tools, the right angle to approach that outside idea. Right. To ride that so, wave. Right. <laughs>